Well, good morning, Merry Christmas, and our early Happy New Year's to each one of you. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of dragging a little this morning. It's been a it's been a busy week, a lot of visiting and a lot of overeating. Amen. Anybody eat too much over these last few days? Why everybody in here, right? Man, it it, it was so good, but uh, man, it's gonna hurt getting it getting rid of it. But oh well, it is what it is. When we get this time of year, the, the end of one year is closing out, and we're upon a new year. Uh, lots of us, you know, we, we get this. It's a good time to start over, right? It's a good time to kind of uh, think about what we did in the past and to kind of look forward to the next year. And, and you know, everybody wants to make resolutions, right? These these come up with a list, and these are the, the things I'm going to do in this next year, or I'm going to shoot for. And a lot of people like to set goals and say, well, I, all right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose weight. I'm going to lose weight. That's always that's a popular one, right? That's probably the top one that everybody says, I'm going to lose weight. And then they're they're committed to it for about the first week and a half, right? The first week and a half, and after that, they realize that they, you know, they, their body hurts, and, it, and, it, and it's hard work, and they're like, well, you know, never mind. I think I'll, I'll pass on that one, and that, that one goes the wayside. Or, or maybe it's to be, you know, more faithful to whatever. And, and over time, it all falls apart. It doesn't hold up. It doesn't last. And uh, we know all we know we need to be resetting ourselves. And I was thinking about that uh, idea of the idea of resetting things is, you know, I, I make no no secret about it. I've told y'all I I enjoy TV. I enjoy watching movies and, and maybe a little too much at, at times. And moving out here to the to the country, we had some decisions to make. And you know, you don't have many options out here. You got you got uh, you can get cable. Uh, through the through the phone service, and that's kind of limited. I mean, if you have a a, a decent TV and, and it's capable of a, you know nice pictures and high definition images, then you know you want to be able to maximize that, right? So the the cable really wasn't much of an option. So I had to deal with satellite. I've never had satellite before, and satellites actually turned out to be a pretty good thing for the most part. However, however, when it comes to raining and and storming. You know, being overcast, those things, it kind of goes away. It kind of gets fuzzies, and, 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 and we lose the picture for a while. And, and that's fine. That don't happen that often. Uh, but what I have noticed, and, and I need to, to call the, the, the service, um, my, my picture will freeze up. I don't know if anybody else has that problem, but I think it's a problem with my box. And the, the picture will freeze up. And what, I, what do I have to do to fix that? i got to pop the little cover off, and there's a little red button in there, and i got to push it. That's the reset button. And every time you do that, that's about 20 minutes. Because what it has to do is reset everything, refresh everything. It's got to relocate the, the signal and, and run through a, a, the little check down list. And uh, I got to thinking about that. And I was like, man, that's a good sermon illustration. That kind of sounds like us, right? When everything's going fine and as, as time goes on, you just kind of, uh, you know, get bogged down and you start having some issues. And sometimes we need to just have a time to, to kind of reset and kind of be refreshed just like in our Christian faith, you know, maybe that's why it is that, that God's kind of built something into us where uh, we always seem to have this craving or this longing for revivals, right? We always need to be revived, even even for like, you know, many churches have done away with midweek services, and, and I understand that. I mean, the, the way we work and different things like that, but for some folks, I look forward to midweek. I look forward to midweek because that, that, that kind of gets me to Sunday, from Sunday to Sunday, that midweek it just kind of feeds my soul. I, I enjoy being able to come and, and gather with the people of God and, and lift up prayer requests and, and, and hear God's word. And so maybe that's what that is, that, that little a mini reset during the middle of the week. And so that's where I want our minds to kind of to, to move towards because we tend to, over a period of time, we just talked about it in, in study school a little bit, is that we tend to drift a little bit, right, over the year. We have the best of intentions, don't we? Like when a, a new year begins, whenever when everything's fresh, in January, we all had this, you know, let's go for it. Man, last year's done. It was a stinker. I mean, I blew it last year, but guess what? January's here, and we're starting over, right? Mr. Floyd, a, a golf, a mulligan, right? A do-over, right? We, we just pick the ball up and drop it when, it when it goes somewhere it shouldn't, right? A mulligan. Well, that's what we say. We say, let's, 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 let's a clean slate. We're going to start in January, and things are going to be over with. All the distractions from my career, done. Family distractions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nip that in the bud, Hobbies, I mean, wasting too much time, over with. Right? Health issues, I got that under control, so now we're going to move forward in this new year. 
And then sometimes we're just in a season of just a spiritual funk. Right? Anybody been there? Are you there now? Right? Feel like you're in the wilderness? So I'm not sure how your 2014 went, but ready or not, 2015 is here. It's here. It's on us. So let's remember the good and let go of the bad. But here's the one thing you need to remember. We need to let, be willing to move on from both. Move on from both. Because sometimes we get paralyzed. We get paralyzed by the, by the past. We can't, we can't move forward. I'm not saying to always forget those things, but we've got to be able to be willing to move forward or we'll get a bit stuck in the past. So uh, we're going to be looking at resetting ourselves spiritually over the next three weeks. Three weeks we're going to spend in Romans chapter 12. We need to be refreshed and updated. and We need to be reminded of what our priorities are as Christians because it gets fuzzy sometimes because we kind of go from one thing to the next in the church and, and we're all guilty of it. We, we find we need to do this or we need to do that or we need to update this, need to update that and, and we wind up running ourselves ragged and we, we forget what our mission is, right? What, what's our mission? Make disciples. Yes? Make, that's it. That's what we do. We, we don't have a 50-point a plan or 20-point plan. We've got a one-point plan, right? What do we do? Make disciples. That's what we do. And so we need to be refocused on this. And we're going to do that from Romans chapter 12. And we're going to start with just verses 9 through 13 this week. And then we'll chop it up and we'll do two more weeks in Romans chapter 12. So let's look at our, our verse, our passage this morning. It begins with, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, and honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, and giving to hospitality. Father, I pray that this morning, as we look at this list, uh, Father, that we're not overwhelmed by it, but we'd be comforted by it. Father, that we would see it as a as a guide for our upcoming year. Father, as we've kind of drifted over this past year and, and kind of lost uh, touch with uh, our mission and our goal, Father, I pray that, that this morning we'd be starting to uh, get our feet back underneath us, Lord, that, that, that this morning uh, as we look at this passage that we would indeed be refreshed and reset to serve you in, in, a, in a better way in 2015 than we've ever done before god thank you for your word thank you for its clarity now father we ask that you would just speak to us through it this morning and we ask this in jesus name amen all right romans chapter 12 just a little bit of background uh, before we move into the text too much Uh, this is a a, a unique uh, book a a unique uh, letter that, that Paul wrote because Rome, uh, the church in Rome was not one that he founded. That this was a place that he wanted to get to, and he eventually did get there. But at this point, he had never met these people before, and he wanted to be able to reach out to them and kind of give some unity to the church. So the church in Rome was like many uh, in that day. You had the very wealthy and affluent of society that were a part of the, 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 the body there, but you also had the very poor and the outcast of society as well. The, the Christianity was inclusive of all people. And a unique thing and an odd thing that we can't really identify with in in our day is you also had slaves and and owners of slaves. And sometimes in the same gathering, you'd have a a, a slave and an owner in the same service. And sometimes the the roles would be reversed. You would have a a slave that would be uh, over their master in the church. And so it's kind of a unique thing. You would also have a mixture of, you know, uh, the Jews and Gentiles as well. But Paul wanted to make sure that all believers... And Jesus were living out their faith properly, right? Because in the body of Christ, there is no, it makes no difference. There is no rich, there is no poor, there is no uh, Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no, you know, black, white, Asian, whatever the race, none of that stuff matters. We're all believers in Christ. We're all followers of Christ. And so he gives an extensive list here of imperatives. And you know what an imperative is, right? It's it's a command. It's if you want to say it, make it simple, it's things to do. Now, I enjoy these type of things. I enjoy these type of passages because that's the type of person I am. Give me a list, right? Don't just give me an ambiguous, you know, you know be more faithful. I want to say, well, well, give me a list. How can I be more faithful? And, and, and I'll, I can do the checklist, right? 
that's my fear of these type of uh, these passages, these type of verses that we will do. We'll just sit as a checklist and we'll go along and, 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 you know, check this, done, check this, done. I'm doing that. Check, 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 check. And that's not what we want to do. These are ongoing things. These aren't our one time events. Their ongoing action is what we're looking at here. That's what the Greek language, if you would uh, do a little deeper study, that's what it means. Each one of these are, are, are presented in a way that they all have a present action, but it also has continuation uh, followed in there, implied there. It's not a one and done, right? Not one and done. You know, you could say, for an example, it, it's not this. It's not this. I loved once, right? No, continue to love. I hated evil once. No, oh, you continue to hate evil. I was kind once. I was affectionate once. I met needs once. That doesn't even make sense, does it? So neither does it make sense in our lives. That each one of these things that Paul's talking about, we, we do it, but we continue to do it. So it's not just a one and done type of thing. So uh, he starts out in the beginning in verse 9 where he should start. And for all of us, he starts out with personal responsibilities, right? Because it, uh, it starts with you. If you're messed up, then there's, you know, the likelihood of you being successful anywhere else probably won't uh, be too great. He starts out by saying in verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Right? Let love be without hypocrisy. And the first thing he deals with is love. And for Christians, for believers, for followers of Jesus, that's where it always starts, right? We love, right? That, that, makes, that makes clear uh, to the world who we are. And that's where Paul starts. Because the Christian life is marked by love for God and love for people. Or it should be. It should be. That's what's known as the great commandment, the greatest commandment. In Matthew 22, uh, 37 and 39 says this. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. pretty clear isn't it think of it this way without love being in you it will never come out of you you ever heard the the illustration the analogy the cup analogy that that your your whatever you're full of will come out when you get bumped into right if you if you're if your cup if your if your body if your vessel was full of hatred when it gets spilled over what's going to come out hatred if, if, if your cup is full of jealousy, whenever you get bumped into, jealousy is going to come out. If, if you're full of, full of love, when you get bumped into, love will come out, right? And so for us, it's love. And of course, our love is an overflow of Christ's love in us. We love because God loves us. Right? We're not capable of loving any other way. And we can't give what we don't have. So, question for you. Do you struggle with loving people right? not because you're you know you've been wounded or you've been hurt and so now you're guarded i'm talking about do you have a a struggle with loving people and expressing love if you do maybe because you haven't received the love of christ there should be no problem for a believer to be able to love someone else and of course paul moves on quickly and warns us to not be hypocrit- hypocritical in our love hypocrite we hear that word thrown around a lot in churches, don't we? Don't don't we get that thrown around a lot by when you when you try to talk to unbelievers, those outside the church? One of the first things they always say, "Well, I you know I don't want to go be around them. They're just a bunch of hypocrites." And you know, sadly, there's a lot of truth to that. You know, in a lot of ways, we we are hypocritical in a lot of things that we do. And so, well, I usually combat that when somebody says that. True enough, I won't deny it. There are hypocrites in the church, but I tell them this. There's always room for one more, right? So come on in. Because I think all of us have a, have a, a bit of hypocrisy in us in our, if we're really honest with ourselves in every different way. And so what is a hypocrite? We hear that word. Uh, it's a person who acts in contradiction to his or her stated beliefs or feelings. Right? Even like the root form of the word hypocrite was like an actor. There was a, a person that put on a mask like in a play or, or, or a production that what we would have is to be a different character. But the truth of the matter is that nobody likes a hypocrite. I don't think anybody goes out looking for, man, I, I, I need some new friends. I need to go find, I want to find some hypocrites to hang around. I really enjoy that. Anybody? I haven't met that person. I'm not looking for it. And uh, also, being hypocritical, nobody likes to feel used or taken advantage of either. 
Right? Show of hands. Anybody like that? I didn't think so. So this idea of being hypocritical in our love, it, it, Paul's trying to drive us to, to, to think this way, that maybe we need to stop using God and stop using people. Right? Stop using God and stop using people. Using God like a genie and using people like they're our servants. Right? Like they're all here to meet our needs. We're being hypocritical in our love when we have ulterior motives. You know what I'm saying there? You you do things not because you love somebody, but you do some, you're doing something to get something in return. Right? Almost like that you scratch I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine type of thing. Right? You have you have an ulterior plan. And you see a lot in church. You see it all the time in church. As a matter of fact, it's something that kind of can be disturbing if you pay attention to it too much. Because you ever notice how some people come and go from the church? You know, come for a while, then they disappear. Fade in, fade out. You kind of you can put two and two together. Uh, they come when they have something they want. Right? Something, something that they want. Right? A health issue arises. They come, they start, they want to be in prayer meeting and people pray over them. That's all fine and good. That's great. They should. And then they, when they're healed up, they receive their healing, nowhere to be found. Right? Right? Or better yet, financial woes. In a bind financially. Come to church, get prayed over. Maybe the church assist, helps out. Finances get straightened up. Look around, where are they at? Nowhere to be found. Now, those are legitimate things to be in church for. And those are legitimate things that the church should su- uh, support and help with. But don't disappear after you've either gotten what you asked for or you didn't get what you asked for. Right? That's being hypocritical. Don't just show up when you want something and then disappear once you get your needs met. That's what it's talking about. Don't use the church. Don't use God. And don't use people. Right? Is that clear enough? That's what Paul's talking about when he says don't be hypocritical in your love. So if we're going to say that we love God and love people, then let's do it. Let's do it. Because the world is looking for an authentic love. And let's be the ones that gives it to them. Right? Everybody's looking for love. And he moves on to say, uh, let love be without hypocrisy and abhor what is evil. Abhor what is evil. That's an unusual word. Did anybody use that word before in a sentence? A bore? I, I, some of y'all are saying, I've listened to, to some sermons before that were a bore. And that was a, that was a good one. Y'all, y'all missed that one. Y'all were sleeping. See, y'all still, y'all are still having a food hangover. Y'all are it's still out there. Y'all struggling this morning. Help me out. Help me out. So in a nutshell, we hate evil. That's what he's saying. We, we hate evil. That's what abhor means, to hate. And we're to hate evil in whatever form it comes in, regardless of what culture says. Because if you haven't noticed, culture, their, their idea of what evil is and what the Bible's idea of what evil is don't quite run uh, together. They actually run against one another. And Robert Mount says it like this, To love God is to, to regard evil with horror. Unfortunately, Familiarity with a culture that is shaped by the forces of Satan has lulled too many believers into a state of general tolerance for whatever deviant behavior is in vogue at present. Right? Would you agree with that statement? Right? We, we, we kind of go along with the flow. Whatever culture says is okay, we kind of go along with it. Or, or if it's you know, something that's you know, major, then we have trouble with it. You know, the, the Bible has a lot to say about hatred. You know, and, and those who don't know their Bible would say, well, no, it doesn't. God, God doesn't hate anyone. God doesn't hate, and, and, and we're not supposed to hate. And that's just simply not true. It's just simply not true. I'll give you seven things God hates in one spot. Let me get Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. It says, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. It's okay to hate what God hates. 
think the key there is that we're not to be hateful. There's a difference there. We don't want to be known as people that are hateful. That makes all the difference in the world. But we live in a, in a day of tolerance. Tolerance, that's the word of the day, isn't it? Don't we, uh, Ronnie talks about how he's been uh, forced to attend some training on tolerance and his difficulties and he struggled, uh, his struggle with that and what his company is trying to uh, ask him to do and uh, he's resisting. Um, our culture just is ate up with it, being tolerant of everyone, being tolerant of everyone except for Christians, if you haven't noticed. Right? Everyone is allowed to say what they want to say and do what they want to do unless you're a Christian. Right? Christians need, need to just keep their mouth shut right? because we're intolerant. Right? It's backwards. We'd say this, if it's sinful and wrong according to the Bible, then it's evil. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. Regardless of what the, what, what the government says, regardless of what the, the law uh, says. And some say evil may be uh, too strong a word to use. You know, when you're like, man, evil, that, that's kind of harsh. That's a little bit, you know, you, you sure that, that we need to say that kind of evil means that's, that's a little too much. Well, here's the news. Here's news for you. Sin is evil. It is evil. It should be. And, and, and we don't think about, you know, we shouldn't think about sin this way. We shouldn't think about it as felonies or misdemeanors. Because sometimes we do that as well, don't we? Don't we categorize sin that one, one's worse than the other? If we just all see all sin as evil, it would make a difference in our lives. And why do we hate sin? Because sin is a killer. Sin is a killer. We hate sin because it's an offense to our God. And lastly, we hate sin because Jesus died to set us free from it, right? That's why we hate sin. That's what the psalmist wrote in Psalm, uh, Psalm 97, 10a. He says, you who love the Lord hate evil. You who love the Lord hate evil. We hate sin in whatever form it takes. And then Paul goes on to say, Love the Lord. Uh, we let let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, and then cling to what is good. Right? We cling, we cling, and the root of the, the Greek word for cling is glue. We get our word glue from. So Paul says to find what's good in this world and attach yourself to it. Right? That's kind of tough, isn't it? You look you looked around. Is it is a is a whole lot of good out there in the world? I'm not saying there is no good. There is good, but it's hard to find, isn't it? Getting harder and harder to find. When I think about clinging to something, do y'all remember back in, oh, I don't know, probably in the 80s, might even been before that, maybe in the 70s. Remember clay, crazy glue? Remember clay? We have super glue now, but crazy glue is what I'm thinking about. And, and those wacky commercials where the guy would come out and he had a, a, a hard hat and he put some on it and he stuck it to an eye beam like that and, and stuck, grabbed onto the, uh, the, this hard hat and, and they lifted the beam with a crane and he stuck to it, right? That's what I think about when, whenever what Paul's talking about here is this to cling to, to find something to it and, and just stick to it and don't let go because we live in a fallen and ugly world that's ravaged by sin and it's hard to find these things and it's easy to dwell on the negative, isn't it? Isn't, isn't it easy to become a, a, a pessimist? And I'm guilty of that as, as well. Especially, I think, maybe as pastors, it's even harder for us because I do see t- so much negative things, and I, and I dwell on the negative. So I have to be intentional about finding the good things. So Paul gives us another word uh, to, to help us with that and, and that hunt for what is good in Philippians 4.8. He says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Right? Whatever we find, meditate on these things, cling to. So, how do we know what's good and what's not? That might be the, a good place to start, right? Because we're like, well, it's relative what i think is good may be good for me but it may not be good for you and what you think is good may not be good to me and vice versa and on and on so we need to have a standard right of what is good we need to have a a a a, a standard and what is our standard of what is good and what's not good the word of god right the bible that's our standard and so we have to daily renew our minds with the word of god daily daily the more we saturate our minds and lives with God's word, the more clearly we will see what is good 
in what is evil. Because over time, like I said, for us keeping it uh, on track with resetting our minds and refocusing on what, what we should do and what we should not do, we need to constantly be in God's Word to help us with this. We're to find what is good and focus on it. That's what Paul's saying here. And then he moves on in the following uh, part of our passage in verses 10 to 13 uh, to focus on our responsibilities to a, our faith family or the family of God, however you want to think about it. By using the words, you know, the phrases of, of like brotherly love and the saints is what we, how we can tell that's what he's talking about here. And we'll deal with how we relate to others uh, later on uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. But today he's focusing mainly on the body of Christ and how we relate to one another. He says in, in verse 10, starting out, he says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. So in a sense, if you want to just narrow it down, be kind. Be kind to one another. Being kind will carry you a long way in life and in the church. Have you found that out? Just being nice, to be kind to one another will, will, will carry you a long ways. Because everybody enjoys being around kind people. And I'll, I don't know anyone who likes to be around unkind people or mean people. Nobody wants to be around those folks. All right? It bears it out in your own life. Who do you enjoy being around the most? All right? Who do you invite to your, your fellowships and your gatherings? Kind people. Nobody's inviting mean people. Nobody's inviting selfish people. They're inviting kind people. They want to be around kind people. And the term where he says kindly and affectionate is translated as devoted in other translations. So I think that's a better word or, or, or a good word. The idea is to invest your time in the lives of your fellow believers. And that's going to require you to build relationships. Right? Build relationships. I don't, I don't mean just you know in, the, in these passing minutes before service and, and maybe a, a, a handshake or a hug on the way out the door. That's not building a relationship. Relationships take time. Relationships take time. They take work. Right? There's pain involved. Right? It's going to take away uh, from your other time that you want to spend doing other things. It's going to mean you invest in the lives of your other uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And the word that he used there is have a brotherly love. A brotherly love. And think of it this way. Any type of love, but especially brotherly love that we have for one another, it's not optional. We don't get to pick and choose. We don't get to decide, well, I will love. That's decided when you accept Christ. We will love. It's not optional for us. That's what it says in John 13, 35. It's a key thing for us. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And John would go even a step further in his letters. We've talked about it on Sunday nights here recently. John doubted your Christianity if you did not love your fellow believers. 1 John 2, 9. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. So this idea of being able to hate your fellow uh, believer, to, to hate a, a, another Christian consistently and with, with no hope of repentance and no, want, no, no desire to reconcile, John would even question your Christianity. So what Paul's saying here, just to boil it all down, is we need to spend time with one another. Right? More than just a passing moment. You know, make a phone call, get lunch, have dinner, have coffee. Just, you know, spend time with one of the, you know, come on fellowship nights. Play some games together. Just watch, you know, hang out, go to a movie. It's not complicated. Just make it a, a priority because we're all busy. Right? We're all busy. Everybody says, well, I got this, this, this. And, and, and look, we all got our list and we all got things to do. But we got to make it a priority or it'll never happen. All right? So be kind. And he goes on to say, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. In honor, giving preference to one another. So what he's saying is to be considerate. Be considerate. What a, what a noble term. What a, what a unique idea. Because in our culture, being considerate is seen as a sign of weakness, isn't it? If, if, you're, if you're willing to let other, other people go ahead of you or, 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 or you know, move ahead of you, then you're, you're seen as being weak, and that's just not the, true, the truth. But because of our fallenness, because of our sinful nature, everyone wants things done their way, right? like babies. And, and every one of us have some, some area in our life where that describes us, that we want things done our way. We want, we'll allow things to be done differently here, but over here we want it done my way. I'll surrender over here, but not here. 
every one of us have an area in our lives where we're not willing to surrender that. Just an example. It's like, well, I'm not sure what you're talking about or what do you mean? Just let others take the lead for a change. You know, some of us uh, have, have control issues. Any, anyone here have any control issues? No? Everybody? Lots of control issues. We all want to have control. So let somebody else take the lead for a change. Let others win the debate for a change. Is there anybody who has to be right all the time? Has to, has to get the last word in all the time? No? <laughs> uh-huh. Getting a little too close to hit home, huh? Starting to meddle a little bit. A simple thing like this. Let, let somebody else pick the restaurant for a change. Not, maybe it doesn't have to always be where you want to go. Let somebody else decide. And how about this one? Let someone else be first in line when we have a fellowship. Right? You ain't got to be first every time, do you? You'll, you'll get food. Right? Let, let somebody else get in line instead of you always being the first one. And so what he's talking about here is giving preference. Giving preference is ultimately about relinquishing control and letting go of power. That's what he's talking about, giving preference. It shows genuine respect and appreciation for someone when you do that. Right? You ever just like, you, you would have never thought, you look around a room and you say, man, these, these, there's so many people here that have been uh, here a lot longer than I have. And, and there's people that's been here that know the Lord in, in a much deeper way than I have. And yet they come and ask you, would you mind leading? Would you mind taking, taking the lead in this? How does that make you feel? It makes you feel appreciated, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel like you have value when that happens instead of always being just pushed to the curb and set off to the side and looked overlooked? It means a lot to someone when they know they are cared for and respected. It goes a long way. So let's practice putting others first this year. We don't always have to be first, guys. And then he goes on to say, in verse 11, it says, Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, and serving the Lord. So you can just boil all this down that we need to be active. Be active. Be active in 2015. And it's all about intensity. Lazy or boring should never be said of a Christian. Ever. If you're bored in your Christianity, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. A Christian should never be bored. Right? We should be the most enthusiastic people on the planet. Why? Because we get to serve the Lord of Lords. We get to serve the Lord. Not we have to serve the Lord. We get to serve the Lord. So think of it that way. And John MacArthur puts it like this. He says, whatever is worth doing in the Lord's service is worth doing with enthusiasm and care. Right? With enthusiasm and care. And every believer is given a spiritual gift to serve the body of Christ. The church, us, 1 Corinthians 12, 6 and 7 says this, and there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. You'll catch that last little bit there. The Spirit is given to each one for the profit of who? All. All. Right? We're to share these gifts. They're, they're for the body, each one of us. So this year, if you don't know what your gift is, maybe we need to work on that. We need to find out what it is. We need to discover what your gift is and get busy using it. And clearly, in this, uh, this case and in many others, it's either use it or lose it. And I found that spiritually, that that definitely fits. Everything we do represents our Lord. So we need to do it with zeal and with excellence. What Colossians 3.23 says, he says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Because right? ultimately, who are we trying to please? The Lord. The Lord. If we please the Lord then, then, and if men are pleased along the way, then that's great. But ultimately, that's the one we're trying to please. So let me say something that might going to sting a little bit. But it needs to be said, starting our, our if we're going to reset and we're going to start over again, I'm just going to say it. Some of you have been sitting around long enough. Right? Some of you have been sitting around long enough. Some of y'all have been on the sideline long enough. Some of y'all have taken a break long enough. Right? If you're called to teach, you need to be teaching. Right? However God has gifted you to serve, you need to be using those things. 
It's time to get moving again. Time to knock the rust off. We need you to do what you're called to do. This body, we need you to do what you're called to do. We need to function in the capacity that God has placed you here for. Stop watching other people serve. Right? If you're called to, to, to serve in a particular way, find a way to use it. Get involved. This isn't it. This is just a small part of it. Just if this, if this is your Christianity, sitting here watching me talk once a week, that's not cutting it. That's not it. Find out what your gift is and get to it in 2015. Get back on the horse. And Paul goes on to say in verse 12, talks about rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, and continuing steadfastly in prayer. So just to sum all that up, he's saying to be steady. To be steady. Don't be wishy-washy. You know, to be steady, to be consistent. And people are always watching us to see how we respond when life happens. Right? When, when life happens. When I say when life happens, whenever things go wrong is what I mean by when I say that. Because things do go wrong in life. Amen? Right? And we must be settled in our hope in Christ. And our hope in Christ cannot be shaken by our circumstances, or it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. When things come along, our hope in Christ should be what sustains us. And just think of it this way. If you could just hold us in the back of your mind when in the middle of trouble, think of it this way. Either God loves us and knows what, what he's doing, or he does not. Right? Let me say it one more time. Either God loves us and knows what he's doing, or he does not. I'm going to go with he, he does and he will. All right? That's what my confidence is in, regardless of what we see. Because trouble is a sure thing in this life. Trouble is a sure thing. And you know it because either you're coming out of it or you're about to head into it. That's the reality. I'm not being doom and gloom, but that's just, that's just the nature of life. That's the way things are. And Jesus, Jesus himself encouraged the disciples with these words in John 16, 33. He said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. In the world you will have tribulation. He didn't say you might. You know, maybe you will, maybe you'll escape through and you'll not have any tribulation. He says you will have tribulation. But he also said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Take comfort in this. We always have the Lord's attention. We always have the Lord's attention. He's never distracted. He's never uh, too busy to hear from us. He delights in our prayers. He delights in our prayers. And think about it like this as well. For you and I, and I've, con I've confessed that my prayer life isn't always as it should be, but prayer should become as natural and necessary as breathing for believers. Right? Prayer should become as natural and necessary as breathing for believers. So why do we pray? Why do we seek Jesus? Because he can identify with everything that we struggle with. And he'll help us. And he'll help us. You say, well, I've been betrayed. Jesus said, check. Been there, done that. Well, I, I've been rejected. Check. Jesus said, hey, I've been rejected. I know what that feels like. Well, I've been called names and ridiculed. Jesus said, check. Been there, done that. I, I, I know what, what you feel. I know what you're experiencing. All these things he's been through and more, way more than what we've experienced. And Hebrews 2, 17 or 18 speaks of this. It says, therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. He knows everything you're going through, everything you experience, everything you will experience, been there, done that. So let's live like people that have hope in the Lord this year. Right? He's never promised us a rose garden. He promised us trouble. He promised us trouble, but he also promised us his peace in the midst of that trouble. He's compassionate towards us in our trouble. So don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. Don't give up. Don't give up. 
whatever you're going through, don't give up. Don't stop praying, pleading with God. He hears, and he'll respond in, in due time. In due time. And then lastly, in verse 13, he says, distributing to the needs of the saints and giving the hospitality. And I would just sum that up by saying for us to be selfless. To be selfless. Now, as Americans, being generous and looking out for others is counterintuitive. It's not really in the DNA of, 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 uh, of being an American. We're, we're about getting all we can for ourselves, taking care of ourselves and pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. And look, I'm, I'm thankful to be an American. I'm thankful to be born in America, and I'm just as patriotic as the next guy. But my loyalty lies with the Lord above everything else. Right? I might be a, a, an American, but I'm a Christian first. And so our character and behavior should be shaped by God's word and not the American culture that we're living in. Now, Christians have always been known for their generosity and caring for the needy. And sadly, that's not always the case amongst the saints. And that's why Paul was dealing with this issue here. That's why he said these things, to distribute to the, distributing to the needs of the saints and giving the hospitality. They, they even struggled with that back then in the early church. In, big, in biblical times, there was just as much of a gap between the has and the have nots, have nots, as there is today. And try to think beyond. Don't just think about Pitkin. Think about, you know, we think about the local church that starts there. I'm talking about, think of the global church. Think of the influence and the resources that we have available here that other places do not have. Right? That's what he's talking about here. Not just the local church, but on a, on a global scale. And there is an expectation for us to look out for one another. It should be. Because the, at the end of the day, if we can't meet the needs of our fellow believers, we won't ever consider helping an unbeliever. All right? if, you, if you can't help your own people, what hope of you have to help anyone else? Why would you even desire to help anybody else? If you can't help the people that you love or say that you love, what hope do you have of helping anyone else? All right? You won't. You just won't do it. But the Bible is clear that we are to take care of one another and look out for one another, to give favor to one another. Look at Galatians 6.10. It says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, and especially to those who are the household of faith. All right? So in 2015, let's be intentional about helping one another out, both locally and globally. I think that, that for... for uh, our church, that's not an issue. Uh, I think we're a generous church. We're a giving church, and I think we do it locally, and I think we do it globally, but we can always do better. We can always do better. We can do more locally. We can do more globally. And let, let's not let our size, because sometimes when we say, well, we're just a small church, we get a small church mentality, and that gives us, that gives us an excuse to why we're not doing more. All right? But I think we can always do more. I think God expects more. We don't want to become complacent. So in closing this morning, I know I've given you a lot to think about. I've talked, I've given you a long list. I went through this verse piece by piece, pulled things out, talked about them. So uh, your mind's probably still spinning a little bit. But the goal is that we need to be refreshed for this upcoming year. So we need to go back and chew on these things. When you go home this evening or during this week, open up Romans 12 again, break these things out and start looking at them one by one yourself and saying, are, are these things evident in my life? Or how can I improve on these things? Or how can I... Uh, change the way I live my life to, to make these things more evident in my life. But here's the key. This ain't, this ain't just a work for you to do on your own. God will honor this. The Spirit of God in you is going to empower you to do all these things. It's not one of these things where I'm just going to exhaust myself trying to do more. Right? God desires these things of us, and He'll give us the power to do it. He'll lead us to do these things. So let's reset our hearts and minds for the Lord's service in 2015, right? In just a few minutes in our time of response, the altar is going to be open. If you need to do business with God, if there's some things you need to repent of, the altar will be open. I'll also be available to pray with you if you need for me to pray with you or like for me to pray with you. I'd love to do that. So this morning as our, our invitation time, as our time of response, it's more about cleaning the slate. And you can do that in your, in your pew where you're at or if you feel uh, the need to come forward, 
and you want to make this an altar to our God, feel free to do that. Whatever God has laid on your heart to do this morning, let's make sure and take care of that before we leave this place. Let's pray, and we'll have our time of response. Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for imperatives, God. So, Father, for individuals like me who, who, who need uh, clear instructions, who uh, like to have lists of, of things uh, to be done, Father, this, this passage just uh, really resonates with me, Father. So, God, I pray that we'll take these things uh, this morning and examine them, Father, that, that you would uh, open our eyes to, to areas in our lives where we've kind of uh, drifted a bit, Father, and, Lord, where there's places where we know we know good and well that we've drifted, and, Father, that we're, we're lingering a little longer than we should. Father, I pray that this morning we would make a decision to, to repent of these things, Father, that today we would make a decision to, uh, to follow after you more closely, Father, that today we'd make a decision uh, to get back on board and serving you in whatever way that you've gifted us to serve. Father, thank you for this place. Thank you for these people, Father. God, I just pray that you would just uh, uh, bless each one that's here, Father, and bless those who aren't here. And Father, those that are still traveling, Father, we ask that you just bring them back to us safely. God, thank you for the time that we have now to respond to you, Father. Just give us courage to do whatever you would call us to do. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>